very excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for coming to our brand new pop-up talk series here at Vision Expo West. You'll see we have some feedback cards here on the cubes. If you could take a minute to fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. This is meant to be casual a conversation, so please feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, and let's get right to it. We are very, very excited to welcome here today Deirdre Carroll, Editor-in-Chief of Envision, and James and Dr. Laura Armstrong of Alberta Eye Care. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, if you are not familiar with Vision Magazine, I have a copy here, which just so happens to have our guests on the cover. Um, so the America's Finest Optical Retailers Contest is a contest that we do every year um, where independent eye care businesses can submit their business to be recognized. It goes through a vetting process, and then we have a panel of expert judges um, go through all of the entries and, and rank them on percentages and on a number of different criteria. Um, those criteria are then ranked by the top winner, and that is how we got to our 2016 winners. Um, Dr. Laura Armstrong and James Armstrong are based in Portland, Oregon, which is a city that is full. I believe in, in your, your entry was something like food, weird, and optometrists are something Portland has a lot of. Um, but you guys, very shortly out of optometry school and your MBA program, decided that opening one more optometry office was the way to go. So. Tell us what that decision was kind of like, um, opening a business that is sort of a, you know, most people open in markets where there are voids, and that's not something you did. So tell us what the thought process was like and how you were starting to differentiate yourselves from some of the competitors in your market. Um, so as many of you know, Pacific University is right outside of Portland. So when we say there was a lot of optometrists, there was really a lot of optometrists all around. Um, the area. So when we decided that we wanted to stay in Portland, we could have uh, gone in the job market, seen what was out there, or we could try to start something. Um, we didn't really know if that was a possibility. We weren't quite sure what starting a practice was like. Uh, but we did find a street in Portland that was very up and coming. Uh, didn't currently have an optometrist, but it was within two miles of some very, very successful practices. Um, and we just kind of started down the road saying, uh, can we get a loan? That was the first thing, because we didn't have any money. Uh, and sure enough, we were able to get a loan. Okay, now now what do we do? Uh, and we really, I relied on my wife here, who uh, definitely knows what she wants, and we kind of moved from there. And, yeah? Yeah, I think uh, just a little bit of a background on me. So before I went to optometry school, I actually worked as an ophthalmic tech, and I worked as an optician, and I worked a little bit as a billing specialist. And uh, when I went back to optometry school, I um, also worked in an independent eye care place while I was in school as a technician. And so I think I took a lot of points about things that I liked in, in those different clinics, things that I thought that those clinics did really well, and things that I didn't like so much in those clinics. And those were all things that when we started a practice, I felt like it was really important for us to, um, to look at each of those individual things. So the biggest thing for me, 100% of the time, is patient care. So we looked at different ways that we could use technology to improve patient care. Um, I think a good thing for, a good part of this for us was that my husband isn't afraid of money in quite the same way that I am. So taking out a loan and doing things really the right way was not something that made him as anxious as it made me. And having that sort of a partnership certainly helped a lot. Um, so when I went to him and said, hey, this is the Optimap that I need to feel like I'm doing a good job and that you know, I am able to provide the patient care I want to, he said, okay, we'll make it happen. When we were open for a few months and I said, you know, I really need an OCT, I'm tired of referring these out, he made it happen. Um, we do all automated proctors. We try to set ourselves apart with a lot of the technology. The other thing that's really important being from Oregon and being a very big reduce, reuse, recycle person was that we would do reclaimed wood in our optical. So we went through it when we did our design for our optical, we used all reclaimed products, all eco-friendly products. Our routing slips are all laminated. We try not to use paper products in the office as much as possible. So we are, um, we're as paper, paperless in the office as possible. And uh, those were all really just important differentiators for us. Not necessarily things that we do different from everybody else, but things that were important to me for not only just patient 
care, but also the patient experience as they come through the office. So one of the many criteria um, and things that the judges and, uh, and the editorial staff and admission looks at when we're vetting all of our entries are the aesthetics of uh, a practice and the dispensary. And, and you know, obviously, if it looks really great, it's welcoming to patients, and someplace patients want to hang out. So tell us a little bit about the process, because you guys not only kind of opened cold in the market, but you did a build out from the ground up. So tell us about the process of all those decisions and the things that kind of went into that process. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we hired an amazing design team. Uh, we hired a company in Portland called DECA. They actually were previously hired by a couple different optometrists in the area. So they understood what was needed in order to build the space out in you know the best way possible. Uh, Uh, I mean, I think it was just hiring uh, people that you trust, and a lot of it we had no experience. We had no experience with the mill work to do the reclaimed wood. We had no experience um, with, you know, oh, I need to have these ports here so that I can run this. Um, so, for example, our equipment vendor, Spectrum Ophthalmic, being able to come in during the build out and say, okay, if you're going to have that equipment, we need plugs there, we need a data port there. Um, and just, you know, having that blank slate and then bringing in all the partners to help us out, I think was key. We, we, we had no experience. And one of the things that um, I recall, you know, from reading your, your, your profile was that it was important to you to kind of reflect the geographical area you were from in terms of Portland and its kind of rich geographic and, and natural history. Um, so there was a lot of attention played, to, as you already said, kind of the reclaimed woods and the color scheme. Um, how has that been another kind of point of differentiation for you? Because a lot of um, opticals and dispensaries tend to kind of all look the same in that very kind of grayish, um, sterile sort of environment. So <laughs> talk a little bit about how the, how you took a total 180 degree from that perspective. So there is a Sherman Williams paint color called <laughs> Moody Blue that people will come into our office and they will just stare at the walls and they will pull their cameras out and they will take a picture of this weird green blue something that apparently it's it's very nice. Um, so that was that was one thing. We are really about making the patient experiences as the best possible experience we can because going to the eye doctor is not always the best, you know, like, oh I can't wait to go to the eye doctor today, but we really wanted to create, you know, an experience that'll make people um, come back year after year because that's important to us. It's not selling the most expensive pair of glasses. It's, it's are we going to be able to build more of a patient base that's going to come back year after year? That's why we did it. And you undoubtedly, you know, built a, a beautiful practice and you gave it a lot of thought and the details and stuff. But you know, it isn't so easy as you know, build it and they will come. Um, you did have to start a patient base from scratch as well. So. How did you go about marketing the practice, you know, the lead up to opening, after the opening, building up a patient base? Um, so you, because you're now almost four years into business, so you have, you know, year over year growth. In so much, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, that you've opened up a second location already, less than four years in business. So clearly you're doing something, something right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how you kind of attracted new patients to the practice. So the biggest thing that, you know, in, in Kind of going down this road of having a proactive approach to eye health and wanting patients that want to come in year after year after year to make sure that we are taking good care of patients. Um, we also are big advocates for being very involved in the community. So when we signed this lease for what was originally just a dirt lot, we kept driving by it going, has anything been built? Has anything been built? And it got us really involved in, in the community by stopping by and going to local restaurants and talking to people and um, and really trying to make a point of getting to know people that were in that area. We got involved early on with a, a local organization called Alberta Main Street and they had a lot of good community involvement projects for us at that time. So we were involved with the Earth Day cleanup, we were involved with the street fair, we, uh, we just did quite a few of those projects even before we were open. So by the time that we opened up, day one, I had all of those different community members were my patients starting from day one. So our first month was actually fairly full. It wasn't until month two when we had taken care of all those patients that we started to feel like, okay, now this is what a cold start practice feels like a little bit more. And uh, since is that then, when the eyeball jello shots were conceived? <laughs> the 
eyeball jello shots were actually conceived by one of my opticians. Um, Alberta Street does a, you know, it's, it's Portland. It's kind of a weird place. So we do a big Halloween thing. We dress up for Halloween. We have thousands of trick-or-treaters that come to our doors every year to get candy. And we thought, you know, what can we do for the adults in this same situation? And, you know, we already serve beer and wine after your eye exam uh, while you're shopping around. And so it's not something that we, it's a foreign concept to us. And, uh, and so we decided that jello shot eyeballs would be a fun thing to do during Halloween as an adult treat. Um, so the first year my optician made a whole bunch of them and the second year I thought, well, I think I could do this too. So yeah, we ended up making, I think last year, 350 jello shot eyeballs for the adults. <laughs> okay, so drunk Halloween. <laughs> Although I have to say, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, you know, parents are the ones who are making all of the decisions about me. So I'm sure they remembered that they were also given um, on to kind of the next topic that I find kind of really intriguing about you. Married couples working together in your business is not particularly unique. However, you two have a little bit of a dream team in that you've got the OD and the MBA. Um, so one of the things I know a lot of independent practices struggle with is kind of getting the, the business side and the medical side to work a little bit more cohesively together. As a married couple, I have to imagine that you guys have a little bit of a leg up on that. Um, are there any like tips or things you kind of learn as a married couple working together in a business that might help other people who don't maybe have the benefit of you know the marital institution to help them along? Yeah, I think, I mean, I identified pretty early on when she was in optometry school because we were dating and then got married um, after her first year that optometrists think differently than, say, a business person would. And it, they have to because you guys learn so much stuff in optometry school that your brain has to be good at memorizing things. It has to be very kind of focused. That's not how my brain works. My brain is kind of up here on the you know, thousand foot level, seeing how patterns are working and uh, reading people, seeing more of the soft skills side, kind of, side of things. So um, I just knew that if it's anything that needs to get done, I can trust her you know, if she wants something, she knows what it is, I can trust her. And then she started to learn about me, and this actually took a little longer to learn that I actually, with my soft skills, and kind of, you know, oh, well, if we talk to an employee right now about that problem, they're going to be really unproductive for the rest of the day because they're going to be more mad than they are, you know, understand what we were trying to say. Just kind of working the soft skills into that um, optometry mindset. Of, you know. That was really hard for me. I had worked for you know, several ODs in the past, and as an OD myself, it was really difficult for me when I had a situation with an employee and I felt like something was wrong. I felt like if this is wrong, I need to fix it. I need to tell the employee that that was something that shouldn't have happened. We need to make this situation correct as quickly as humanly possible. And that first year was a lot of growing pains for me to understand a little bit more the on the business side of things, how those situations should be approached, when those situations should be approached, how to take a little bit more diplomatic view and how to take a more global view of how this plays in. You know, this is a, a one-time situation. Is it something that is going to become a multiple-time thing? Do I really need to address it right now? Can I wait till the end of the day? Can I wait till the end of the week? When does it make sense for this to happen? So um, he taught me a lot about that. I think you're right that in a, a lot of ways people ask us, you know, how do you handle working with your spouse? I feel like working with my spouse is the greatest thing. He understands how I function. I understand how he functions. We don't have to have conversations about that. Um, so I think that definitely gives us a leg up. And I think that's a big thing that when you're working with somebody who's not your spouse, it takes time to get to know them. And it takes time to get to understand the way that they tick, the way that they function, why they do the things they do. And it's important to give people the benefit of the doubt. If nothing else, that's something that I've definitely learned right off the bat, that most people are not doing things maliciously. They usually are trying to do the, to make the right decision. So to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, when I, was, when I was in my MBA, I remember specifically, we did like a hierarchy of the worst situations to be in as an employee. And I, I think top of the list was family business, married bosses. And so I, I'll usually warn people during interviews, like this is what you're getting into, we understand it. Uh, it's There are gonna be times when employees try to play like the good parent versus the bad parent, try to get things past us. I'm but the bad parent. She's the bad parent. Um, 
but uh, we've, we've been able to make it work and we actually just had two of our employees that got married to each other two weeks ago, so now we have a real loving before situation. They got, before before we act, they were dating when we, or they were engaged, I think, when we hired the second one on, and we had had a conversation with them about the pros and cons of working together with your spouse and when you need to turn it off and, you know, all of that stuff. So it definitely has its own set of challenges as well as advantages. So we talked um, a little bit about how when you decided that you wanted to stay in Portland and make Portland your home and you decided you wanted to open a business there that was already kind of a, a, a rich uh, a business, um, you went with an approach that you're just going to keep doing it until someone tells you no and, and no one said no and all of a sudden you found yourself with a business um, and then you know like a year after that you kind of approached the second location the same way. What have been some of the, the lessons you kind of learned in having the two different locations now? Because there are, there are some people who open one practice and never get to the point of being able to open a second and you not only did it that you did it before the first one really, you know, had gotten to puberty even. So tell us a little bit about how that yeah. has kind of been a surprise. The one thing I've noticed from having two practices is from the OD perspective, it is it's a bear. I mean, she is having to go back and forth. She's very cognizant of what our associate doctors, how they're practicing. There's double the patients. Um, so I think without having someone like me that can kind of float and be more of like a corporate management, I, I don't think we would have gotten into that at all. But we had that situation. It's something that I kind of enjoy, that part of it. And then it was just an opportunity that presented itself. And yeah, we just kind of kept saying, well, we can, maybe we'll doubt, we'll talk to a real estate broker, we'll talk and see uh, if the bank wants to give us another loan. We certainly hadn't paid off the first one. Uh, and it just kind of kept going, and now, uh, now it's fully up and running. Have there been challenges that have come with having either the two locations in general or that one location presents that were a surprise because they don't present in the other location? I think one thing that surprised me that we actually didn't foresee was um, employees. We took some of them, they're only like 10 miles apart, so we were able to take some employees and move them over and kind of you know, put our stamp on it, but we didn't anticipate some of the employees kind of feeling like they were getting put to the B squad go into the new practice, we kind of just assumed, oh, they're going to want to go work for a new practice. That's great. Um, and so that was a little bit of having to step back and find out who wants to be at that practice versus who wants to be out in the more fast-paced, you know, uh, busy environment. Um, so it definitely hasn't hasn't all been rosy, but it's, it's fun. Now, was it important to you that the two locations have distinct personalities, or did you just try to kind of take the model you knew had worked and kind of replicate it? It was extremely important to us that they had two very distinct personalities because the way that Portland is, is Portland is, rather than being this big city or this big metropolis, it really is a series of neighborhoods that make up a city. And if we had taken our original location, even just the name, Alberta Eye Care is Alberta Eye Care because we are on Alberta Street. We named our second location Cathedral Eye Care. It's uh, near Cathedral Park in a different neighborhood. They, the neighborhoods are very different. The people that make up the neighborhoods are very different. The business dr districts are very different. So despite the fact that they're both in Portland and there were some things that we certainly wanted to carry over like the technology aspect, the patient care aspect, um, those things we certainly wanted to carry over. At the same point, there's different community outreach to be done. There's, you know, there's just a different personality with that different location. Yeah, the one caveat being that we assumed because the new location was in a more blue collar neighborhood that maybe we should carry a little dull down our frames, less color. That was wrong. They wanted color out there just like the, the kind of hipster neighborhood where we're, our first location is. Um, so that was another thing. We kind of had to immediately revamp some of our frame lines and bring in just more color, more pop because that's what we're selling. Yeah, we assumed that because it was that little bit more blue or color area, we were also going to just have a lower lower margin, lower cost on frames that would be, you know, that people would want in that area. So we did go into it with a little bit of this bias of this is what this neighborhood is going to want. And of course, starting, you know, fresh out the gates, people did not buy those frames. And so that was a very big thing that we had to turn around and change pretty darn quickly. Okay, so um, one of the things that the vision does, and I think we do well, is we try to um, reflect expertise on subjects outside of the industry that could be beneficial to the small business owners and 
inside the industry, um, one of the questions we ask a lot of, of the subjects that we profile in the magazine is um, what sort of homework they do, what sort of books they read outside of the industry. Um, and so we asked that, put that question to you guys, and you had came back with us, at us with a few um, suggestions, mostly from this talk, that are reaching behind me, hey, look at that, yoga's <laughs> panel. Okay. And the author was John Cotter. You recommended several of his books, and so we got a couple of them. Tell us a little bit about the author and why you like his writing and how it's been beneficial in the running of your business. So when I was uh, when I was doing my MBA, I definitely felt like a lot of it is high-level soft skills stuff. But I do remember specifically taking a course on leading change, um, and the course was basically centered around a lot of the work of John Cotter, who's a Harvard Business School professor and does a lot of writing on change leadership. Um, and what he does is he actually provides some kind of uh, steps and a game plan for when you're approaching change in a business environment. Uh, this book, My Iceberg is Melting, Our Iceberg is Melting, is kind of a little fable uh, that uses, uses kind of a soft, easy to read story to identify typical office culture and typical problems that you'll face when you try to make a big change. Um, so when this came up was when uh, about a year in, we decided to switch EHRs, and we decided, my wife thought it would be a good idea to do it in December. Not a good idea. Because that's not a busy month for optometry at all. Uh, and so, we really approached that with, okay, we're going to make this big change, our employees are going to hate it, because, you know, especially uh, the optician model was completely different from EHR to EHR, so we kind of revisited um, some of these writings and put some of the steps in place, you know. Uh, create small victories, uh, make sure that the staff feel like they're participating. Um, there's just kind of all those things that really made a difference because that could have been a huge disaster if they would have revolted on us and said, no, we don't want to make this change. Um, so. And that was not the only change we made. I mean, for a practice that's you know almost four years old, we changed our computer system over, we changed our credit card system over, changed our phone system over, so we've changed a lot of things, and so we've had to go through a lot of these different changes with our staff and, you know, really talking to them in advance about what these changes are going to entail. I think my mic's going in now. Uh, what these changes are going to entail is key to keeping our staff morale high so that they keep uh, doing a good job for us. Okay, so I, I can sit up here and ask the questions all day long, but um, part of these pop-up talks is to, to get you guys to ask questions that you might have um, for our uh, speakers up here. So, Dr. Scott, let's go with you. And by the way, I wasn't going to mention this because I wanted to see what kind of reception I got, but I was going to bribe you with the two copies of the book mentioned, so Dr. Keating gets a book. Yay. And there are only two. <laughs> Assuming that uh, we all get great customer satisfaction, what do you feel is a thing that patients come in and say, that was a wow factor? Was it the selection of frames or a certain special thing in the gift bag if you do that? What's something commonly go that's really different? Uh, she probably doesn't want to speak to this because it would be speaking about herself, but from early on it was they loved the patient experience that they were getting with my wife. Um, she probably spends on average 20 minutes in room. No. I spend probably 35 minutes in room. I am a huge proponent of patient education on every single front. Um, it's definitely the biggest deal to me and by the time that we get to the end, if we have nothing left to educate, then we'll talk about fun things that we've gone and done and fun restaurants to go to and um, getting to know my patients is part of the reason I went into private practice. I love talking to people. Um, but aside from that, because that's something that, you know, a lot of people bring up to me, well, that's great when you're the only OD. As soon as you hire associate ODs, how does that transfer over? And uh, we actually just got back from a weekend where we did a big doctor's retreat. We tried to get on all the same page about how we want to educate our patients and how we want to make sure that we're getting through and getting across those same points. Um, I think another big thing for us is just we communicate a lot. We stay in touch with our patients. We make sure they know that we appreciate them. Um, we had the very, very fortunate opportunity of opening up right next to Salt and Straw, which in our area is a big ice cream shop. 
And so for birthdays and things like that, we give out salt and straw certificates when people come in around their birthday, we'll surprise them with one. Um, so we just try to do little things like that to let everybody know that they're appreciated. A big thing that also stood out to our patients is we know our market. I love I love Portland because I am a Portlander. So I love all of the green, eco-friendly things. Our patients see things like those laminated routing slips and they go, oh my gosh, that's the greatest idea. And I'm like, well, I didn't invent the wheel. I took it from somebody else, but glad you noticed it. Um, so I think just making sure that you're speaking to your market and you understand the patients that you're serving and you try to serve them in the best way you can. I think that's something we all do, right? Yeah, from a frame selection standpoint, it's actually, we do get a lot of comments on this because it's very boutique looking optical, the reclaimed wood, the wires and everything, but we were very cognizant of having frame prices from being able to accept uh, Oregon's Medicaid plan all the way up to some of the higher end reclaimed or, you know, wood frames and stuff. So a lot of people come in thinking, oh, this isn't for me, and then are pleasantly surprised to know that we carry a wide variety of frame selection. Yeah, being a very community-based clinic was extremely important to me. So that is definitely a big part of our model too. You know, we, we there's I think only one insurance company that we don't accept. We try to accept everything because people don't get their insurance and I want to be able to serve everybody. Okay, do we have any other questions for Robert Ike over here? Because if not, I get to keep the book. <laughs> okay, we have Sean Connolly, OD, Insight Eye Care of Cody, Michigan. I don't want to hear any Spartan related <laughs> University of Oregon jabs, please. Oh, okay. so, yeah, I don't think we meet this um, no, I'm just curious more about the specific frame lines. When I was talking to some of the vendors, they had mentioned that you carry their lines and trying to distinguish them. Is there private label stuff or um, the mainstream things or you know, try to tie in also with third party? So we carry a lot of independent frame lines. Uh, Vinyl Lines is over here. We carry their frame lines. We love them. Uh, we carry LAI Works. We carry Cutlery Gross. We do tend to carry most independent, mostly independent frame lines. Um, not only is that something that's very much something that's wanted by our patient demographic, but that's something that our opticians love to sell. Good quality products. Yeah, I think people assume that we are anti-brand name, but really we're reflecting the neighborhood that we opened our practice. I wouldn't tell someone that was opening in Beaverton right next to the Nike headquarters not to carry Nike. That wouldn't make any sense. Um, so we carry frames that um, I think our patients really appreciate. Oh, that's a smaller brand. That's something I haven't heard of. And then the most important thing we learned was carrying brands that your opticians like. So if your optician likes the brand, they're going to sell a ton of it. Um, and we, in particular, this uh, frame line Andy Wolf, um, one of our opticians had a personal relationship with one of the reps, and so all of a sudden, you start seeing those frames just flying off the shelf, and they're great frames, but what really made the difference is the opticians wanted to sell them. So find out what your opticians want to sell, and they'll get passionate behind it and sell it. Yeah, and while we don't have any of our staff right here right now, that is one thing that we do like to do is bring our staff to the show so that they can have a big part in what frame lines we're carrying so that they will pick up stuff that they want to sell. Um, you guys, we are about out of time. I do love the fact that people were talking about what envisions America, <laughs> America's Red Sox company Taylor carries. I love that. Um, but sitting up here and talking is a little... Uh, a little parched so we're gonna hang out for a little while we're gonna get some champagne if you guys have any more questions feel free to come up to us and we're happy to, to talk to you thank you guys for, for coming yeah, thank, thank you, you so much